This episode of our This Week in XR podcast is sponsored by Zapper. Zapper is one of the world's leading XR companies. Over the past 12 years, they've won numerous awards for memorable campaigns. They've democratized AR by making tools and SDKs that anyone can use. And they created Zapbox, the world's most affordable mixed reality headset. Most recently, Zapper worked with Unilever to create an enhanced QR code called Accessible QR, which enables packaged goods to speak to the blind and partially sighted. If you're thinking XR, give the team at Zapper a call or visit Zapper.com to see how they can help you on your XR journey. Good morning, everybody. I'm Charlie Fink with Ted Shilowitz. It's This Week in XR, December 8th, 2023. Welcome to show 172, Ted. Well, 172, we're, we're getting close to our 200th episode. We thought it was a big deal when we had 100 episodes. <laughs> but we're without Roni today. Uh, yeah, Roni had to work today. Yeah. So one day Roni will tell us what, what he really does at Boston. What he's actually Consulting. working on all day. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, big AI news this week. Oh, before we do that, let me, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I rarely remember to thank our sponsor, but I am thankful to our sponsor, Zapper. And also our guest today, John McInnes, uh, a filmmaker who is um, was a, a screenwriter for Call of Duty. Uh, he's written a bunch of movies. He's uh, working with uh, Unreal Engine, uh, Epic Games on a feature. So uh, hopefully he'll tell us more about that when he jumps in yeah. in a few John minutes. John is a longtime, longtime friend of mine and colleague, so that's good. We'll have a nice discussion with him. Um, excited about that. And uh, so just getting to the news, of course, I, I was um, I was excited to see Grok went live this week, and uh, I guess I'm going to have to get it. I don't know if you're going to get it or not, but Scoble. Uh, yeah, Grok. I guess I'll have to get a version of it. Grok Pro now, or it's part yeah, of it's Twitter Pro, Pro it's, X Pro, or it's it's their sixteen dollars subscription. Um, yeah. Scoble asked it uh, to give him an update on the week's AI news. And he may have done a better, it may have done a better job than I do. So I guess I better pay attention to that. <laughs> are you, Charlie, are you feeling, are you feeling the sense, I mean, this technology wave, we often make the reference to, you know, eating the world, right? It feels like AI news fervor, creationism, companyism is eating the world right now. Like you cannot, it's overwhelming to see the amount of stories, certainly the amount of technical progress um, some of the discussions around, you know, guardrails and government controls. There's a lot of interesting sub threads on stuff, but just like seven, eight years ago, when we had this kind of moment that social media in all forms is eating the world, it feels like AI is now in that moment of eating the world. Certainly you can't look at news headlines without seeing AI. It's, you know, again, I've said this before to you and on the show, it really feels like that internet moment in 1995 when no one could stop mm-hmm. talking about the internet and online yeah. services. And it just seemed to be the only news story, uh, particularly business news story. Um, so uh, anyway, yeah, it feels Brock, like, uh, Brock is supposed uh, to be feels- good. I, you know, it may turn out, by the way, I, I know I love to make fun of X. Uh, and I have said many times that I think that the idea of a AI being fed by a, a Twitter feed is a terrifying uh, possibility. Uh, it <clears throat> it uh, maybe that I'm wrong about that, and uh, Elon Musk is right. So how about that? The onion layers keep getting peeled back. But I, my point here is, no one knows anything. We don't know what's going to happen. Right, and and whether you're wrong or Elon's right might not even be the right question to to postulate. Correct. In just fifteen minutes from concept. now, it may not even be relevant. Right. The concept of is free will right, right, is, you know, do we even have free will anymore in the age of AI, right? So because somebody could be playing 3D chess five steps ahead of you and you would never know it. You would never know. So Meta introduced an image generator there. They they announced a suite of upgrades to its uh, various AI uh, applications. Uh, But but what got me excited is they have a text to image um, app. Uh, it is available on the web for free and it is blazingly fast. It will generate an image in, I don't know, one 
25th of the time it takes mid journey or one of the other image. So it's that dramatic, right? It takes like four seconds. Mid journey can take four minutes. Uh, right. Because okay. it's using a different methodology to, to what I understand, right? It's, it's basically using a large repository of images to synthesize the image that you ask for or, or put in your prompt versus mid journey or runway or some of the others that are actually doing more of an AI biasing to try and uh, achieve the objective. So it's a slightly different algorithm that's doing it. Is that with that? The model, that a, the model is called EMU and it's trained on 1.1 billion images. Uh, but images only, right? <clears throat> From what I understand. Uh, yeah, that I don't know. But uh, 1.1 billion images is a heck of a lot more than people like Firefly, who use mm -hmm. the Getty Images library exclusively. Uh, and by the by the way, um, Runway just made that same deal with Getty Images. So Getty Images um, really getting <clears throat> spread across a lot of the big AI models uh, to avoid... Um, getting ensnared in the copy, anti -cop, copyright issues being brought up around uh, the training of AI yeah. models. So effectively, you get into like two lanes. One that is trying to essentially control that and say, we're using our repository of images that we actually have uh, negotiated rights to use and disseminate. And the other, in, in the case of Meta and a few others, are basically doing a much wider swath and I guess because they're not actually technically charging for it, right? They're just using uh, their ad revenue model um, to drive this stuff. So it's uh, there's a lot. Well, the the Imagine this, app right? does not. The Imagine app does not have any ads. It just you type. It has a a place for you to type, and uh, and then it has a place for the images to show up. So it's, it's up, not yeah. nearly yeah. as complex as as the other ones. You don't have as much control, but it's so fast. It is so fast. I mean, it's. I mean, Dali is fast. It's faster. Yeah, so, I mean, in our world, you know, for for previs and coming up with conceptual ideas and looking at stuff and being able to whip things out in a meeting, like in real time, and say, "What if we look at this? What if we discuss this? What if we create this this way?" It's an interesting tool set. One of the things that I put up in the um, column on Forbes today is a couple of links to more cinematic AI. You know, I love this director, Dave Clark. Uh, who uh, lives here in LA, and uh, he put up um, a Lego commercial. I mean, not a Lego commercial, a uh, a commercial for Adidas that he made in like four hours, and he pitched it to Adidas. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, they, the, the abilities that it is giving filmmakers and other artists to quickly create prototypes and express their ideas visually is... Um, is just unprecedented. I think people in Hollywood are finally now that the strikes are over, starting to embrace the incredible um, superpowers that this can give to creative people. Um, yeah. Here's a story Roni sent to me. I'm sorry he's not here for this, but you know, Chris Kiss just retired. They had their final farewell show, uh, their farewell farewell show at Madison Square Bar Garden, and they unveiled at the end of the show following a rendition which had them um, swinging around the giant arena on cranes while playing i want to rock and roll all night and then they climactic smoke and fireworks and they unveiled their avatars they're not retiring only their physical selves are retiring they will but live on they will live on in the metaverse <laughs> i guess there'll be a kiss tour in the metaverse whenever yeah maybe there'll be kiss island on fortnite Right. Well, you know, I tell you what, what I find kind of interesting that with that is not so much watching on your computer screen, but the evolution of live entertainment using digital assets, right? Sort of, you know, going back all the way to the, the Pepper's Ghost Illusions and, and building things that don't necessarily have the physical embodiment of the performers, but a digital embodiment of the performers. So it's more theme park attraction stuff. Uh, you know, you go back all, go all the way back to the Hall of Presidents, right? We have every president that ever lives uh, in an avatar version as a physical embodiment with robotics, right? But now because of digital technology, yeah, uh, we don't necessarily need physical robotics. We that's can right. do digital so robotics. Go to Disneyland and have a much better conversation with Mr. Lincoln. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So Lego. Um, so you know, I think the Kiss thing is interesting. It's an interesting story. I think it's a 
it's an interesting trajectory yeah, we'll, of what we're entertainment gonna, we'll see what yeah building. we'll see what happens and we'll see how relevant kiss really is to people in the metaverse uh as it develops over the next decade or two uh Look, you know here's a good reference point charlie as as a kid i remember there was a a, a cartoon series of kiss they actually made a cartoon <laughs> and you know is that any different than what they announced at their concert it's just a different form of the technology like, of the day right it's 3D. Those are avatars, right? <laughs> it, They're it's avatars 3D and, and, and they may be, you know, each one of them a little chat GPT of, or sorts. Yeah. So yeah, who knows? So Epic Games took $2 million from the Lego group and Sony. Yeah, uh, this is what you want to talk about. Before, yeah, yeah, Sony a, a, a little over a year and a half ago. And uh, today, and this week, Lego Fortnite has arrived. Mm -hmm. And it combines elements of Minecraft with other things like the you know, Battle Royale, and uh, it is quite a large world. I have not been in Fortnite, I have to admit, for probably over a year. So I guess they, they got me back for this one. So I'll uh, I'll let you know what I find there. But, uh, you know, Lego is a great brand. Um, everybody understands how Legos work. So no yep. splitting to do. You know, there's no, it's, it's uh, you know, we all grew up playing with Legos. So I think that they have uh, a pretty good chance of succeeding with that. Well, look at it through a, through a digital lens, right? If you look at Minecraft as a, a form of art, it's effectively digital Legos, right? I mean, that's kind yeah, of what it right. was. And now here comes another page uh, in the book where Lego itself. Right. Here comes, here comes the actual Legos. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, which is kind of interesting. So there's a, you know, there's a game to be played across all this type of entertainment stuff. So <clears throat> Looking Glass, our friends at Looking Glass make what they call a holographic display. So let's say you're making a 3D model. They have a little display, sort of a secondary display, uh, and it shows the whole 3D model without glasses, without picking up, you know, a VR headset. Uh, you know, you can look at and manipulate things in 3D. So now they've taken and they've made a small. They made a smaller. They keep making them bigger and bigger and smaller and smaller. So they have like a giant screen looking glass, and now they have a pocket sized looking glass, mm. uh, and it's cheap. Uh, so it fits in your pocket. It costs uh, less than $150, and uh, and it's available on Kickstarter. I don't normally recommend Kickstarter, uh, but in this case, it's from a pretty well-known company that's been around for seven or eight years uh, and, and is well-known for making its displays. So you're not taking that big of a chance. It ships in yeah. January. Not a very good Christmas present, uh, but uh, I guess for those who are patient. Uh, it will uh, it will soon arrive. So uh, and you know you Charlie you and I have used like the the, the smallest ones were the sort of six inch kind of lucite yeah. substrate yeah. ones. So uh, I haven't seen this yet. How much smaller is it? Like we say, it's pocket size. Is it a little cube? Uh, it's about the size of a smartphone. So it's more of a screen, like a more of a flat screen than a cube sort of. Yeah. I, I, yes. Yes. And okay. I think we'll look, we'll look at it online. Uh, yeah, I think the form that. is foldable. So um, interesting. Oh, it's a little you unfold it. I don't. I don't think the glass is folding, but apparently you unfold it, and it. Uh, mm. This is a little portable three D display. Yeah. Cool. Glasses free three D display. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, glasses free three D display. Hey, Charlie. Come on. How you doing? Thanks for joining us. Great to see you this morning. Yeah. You too. I appreciate you reached John reached out to us last week uh, because he is a listener and was um, following up on the show with Joe hunting, where we were talking about filmmaking in VR chat. And uh, he mm -hmm. said, Hey guys, I've got, uh, I've got a related project and uh, I've been a big uh, fan and follower of Joe's work. And <laughs> I said, well, as it happens, <laughs> you can come on the show too. So here you are. I'm be our guest. <laughs> Well, thank I, you for bringing me on. A pleasure. A so, pleasure. yeah, no, no, I've been following Joe for a while since um, his documentary kind of uh, came on my radar, you know, a year or two back. And um, uh, it, it's interesting because I, I, I'm currently making a movie in Unreal and been at the forefront of making uh, uh, movies and content in Unreal in you know VR, Texile, whatever we call it these days. Um, <laughs> And I was very interested in the culture that was coming out of VR chat in terms of what people were doing in there. Um, it seems like one of the one of the areas where actually people were actually going and creating stuff themselves. Yeah. So uh, Joe's documentary 
was a great insight into that world. Um, as, I was, as I was, I was researching a lot of VR chat for the script that we're current, uh, for the movie we're currently making, and so um, you know my, my research led to led to Joe and uh, conversations with Joe. So good. So John, why don't you you back the listeners up a step? Give us uh, a little career arc and what brings you to this stage of your career where you're working with again cutting edge technology. You've always been working with cutting edge technology at every sort of juncture of your creative career, directorially and writing, creating, uh, but maybe give us a, a quick summary of what you've done uh, over the past, what, let's call it 25, 30 years of this work, <laughs> and then um, flash forward to what you're working on today. So I guess the big shift was, um, so I came to Hollywood 20 years ago to be a screenwriter. Um, I won something called the Nicole, the Academy Nicole, which is the, the biggest screenwriting competition in the world. Um, just over a decade ago, I won that. And then I got repped by ICM and Brillstein, and I thought, well, my screenwriting career in Hollywood is 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 up and running. And the thing that I was hired on wasn't a, a movie; it was a video game, Call of Duty. So I, you know, the script I'd written was about private security contractors in Iraq, and it's like this very intense war kind of movie. And so um, the producers over at Activision uh, had uh, got wind of this script, and uh, they read it and loved it, and then hired me to write Call of Duty: Advanced Warfare, which um, propelled me into games which wasn't wasn't even on my radar I was I was like a movie guy movie character story um now let me let me pause you for a second there because it's rare to have someone on here that can help the people that listen to this kind of understand what it means to write a script let's put it in big quotes for a triple a video game right so maybe describe the form of that what it looks like what it feels like different than you know the hundred and 16 page that you would get from a narrative uh yeah. you know script for a movie give give a sense of what it feels like to write something like that and how it goes through its process um i think i mean the first thing to say is you know a script and script format is very much um established you know it's 100 120 pages it's a very specific format that relates to it's like a blueprint um of what the movie could be that everybody involved in that can kind of get on board and see it and understand it whereas on a video game um, because the nature of video games and video game technology and the variety, the sheer variety of video games, um, almost every studio, I think, has their own method of how to write for that or create for that. And so it's a very fertile ground for creativity and writing. And that was what um, I got inspired by. So but specifically for writing Call of Duty. Um, so what they were bringing me on board was they they would they, they didn't want somebody, a quote unquote, game writer. They wanted somebody from Hollywood to come in and give it cinematic storytelling. So, um, you know, Kevin Spacey was being, being hired as the best. I'm writing for Kevin Spacey on, on Call of Duty. And um, and at they, 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 that point, as I say, it was the, where Call of Duty was at was just, it was just it was gonna be the first title to be launched on the new PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. So there was this jump in graphic fidelity that they were able to kind of capitalize on. This was going to be the first title to be that. So they really wanted to make this like a cinematic Call of Duty that had never been done before. And as I say, like hiring Hollywood talent like Kevin Spacey, making it more, you know, cinematic. You know, they were very inspired by stuff like, you know, Black Hawk Down and all the sort of, you know, great Hollywood blockbuster movies. So they wanted me to bring, I guess, that that Hollywood um storytelling um to 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 the game so it, in, in a way as i said like it's it's not like a one size fits all with with any writing assignment for a video game because you know it's very specific to the specific um game mechanics um architecture of what that game is as to as to how that is but uh, with that in mind um so it, it is you know obviously you know i was mostly involved in the the campaign part of it which is essentially like a story that takes place over like 18 levels so uh, i think of it almost like a like a mini series in some ways and you know heavily interspersed with cutscenes. um cut scenes are like little short short move, movies or scenes from the the story um that are very much structured like any you know piece of screenwriting writing with a scene with actors and you know everything so it was a combination of designing the um, overall story arc. I mean, the the uh, the uh, um, Sledgehammer Games they they had a very much an idea as to what the sort of story kind of could take. And my script that won the Nickel was all about this world of private security contractors and the corporatization of war. So so we were able to like establish what that arc of that story could look like and who the main characters were, um, what their particular arcs within the story and game could be. Um, you know, it's it's so it's it's so it's interesting. So 
I'd say like when, when they presented to me first, like, well, this is this is what the, the script we've got. And they presented me with an Excel spreadsheet. So, you know, they, they would like basically look at story and and a script as just units of information. Right. So it's like, well, this is the word, this is the script, and it's like listed upon, you know, next to a sound effect or whatever, and like this, and it's a very unorganic way of approaching it. And so I said, well, we need to start with a script format if we're working with actors and creating a scene with actors that is going to make sense to actors and get the most out of actors. Um, you're not going to present a, an Excel spreadsheet to Kevin Spacey. <laughs> you're right. going to present a script. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of that was was working on story um not just the sort of mechanics of scenes and then i was writing all of the scenes for all of that stuff um working with the level designers so it's it, it's it's a very collaborative process on any game of that scale it's a massive massive endeavor um but working with the actors working with the the animation directors and and everybody involved you know being on the floor sometimes for all the mocap um so so basically sort of trying to bring what i could bring to their process um, and bearing in mind that it, at the end of the day, it's a game, it's not a movie. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess, you know, and I say, like, when you're dealing with the high level actors like Kevin Spacey, um, and also, I mean, veterans like Troy, you know, Troy Baker, you know, it was, it was um, the, one of the main characters who's a really amazing, uh, mostly known for his video games, but, um, you know, fantastic acting talent. And I, uh, so I was always like interested in what we can bring that we're already doing in movies in terms of storytelling in terms of performance that that we can enhance games with and so the so so for years, the for the the cut scenes or the cinematic scenes it sounds like you would literally be writing it just like a, a movie script or a tv a two minute section and you're writing the full dialogue uh and all the the visuals and then that's created and rendered out right and yeah. then for the interactive stuff when you talk about the campaign for those that don't play video games in a, yeah. in a war game like call of duty you're you're sort of one of the soldiers that's following along with the lead one or two soldiers. And you would have to be writing multiple dialogue tracks to, depending on what they would say, depending on your actions. Uh, and that would all that, live in that spreadsheet. How would that, that work? That, that's certainly um, part of it. Um, yeah. I mean, I actually went on afterwards to write a video game that was a lot more like sort of telltale games kind of model of storytelling, which is a lot more sort of branching storylines and stuff like that, which was more involved with that. Um so yeah, it really depends. You, you're you're really bringing your screenwriting skills and your storytelling skills to whatever game is presented. And then you can kind of look at the game and analyze what is needed, how best to utilize that. And that's why it's very creative because you're like, oh, we haven't done this before. You know, you just think about okay, well, you're now a first person character as opposed to a third person character. You know, you are you know making these choices. What choices can you make? All of those sorts of things right. um, would, would seem very very interesting to me. And then VR happened uh, straight after that. You know, 2014, 2015, and I was like, oh, this is it. I'm in the perfect spot to explore this new realm of storytelling. Um, we were making high level digital avatars. You know, I was very interested in, in digital avatar. You know, we've been basically, you know, in the last eight years making high level, the cutting edge of digital humans, because I was like, well, this is perfect. Like put, you know, we'd made, you know, we didn't make Kevin Spacey, but you know, for, but you know, Kevin Spacey's digital avatar in the game. Well, why don't, why, you know, why aren't we? That's, you know, John, that's where we met was you were exhibiting at the art yeah. of VR uh, at South that's of right. New York in 2017. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We we did Trump and Obama. Um, it was actually for, the, for that those Trump and Obama we we made for Harry Shearer because Harry Shearer got wind of what we were doing, and uh, we did this whole piece back in 2016 with where he wanted to play Trump and Obama, and so we we created that. And it was ironic because he wasn't interested in 3D or VR at all or AR or anything. He just wanted to use you know performance capture and digital real time digital avatars to make 2D linear content. And I was like, but but Harry, we can do that. And we can put you in that scene in VR. And uh, and so, you know, I've, I've always, you know, ever since Call of Duty, and I, you know, once you understand the possibilities that the technology um, open up as a creative person, you're just like, boom, like, what can we do in that space? And it's, you know, so the, for the last eight years, I've been obviously working in VR and XR um, because that was, you know, in, in very much around digital humans. A lot of the stuff hasn't been seen public. Oh, we, we made David Bowie, which you may have seen some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But we did a whole performance capture test with uh, with that, basically exploring with uh, um, David Bowie's manager and and various members uh, around that, around what we could do with a with a digital um, avatar of David Bowie. Um, I, I mean, I was like 2018. I was talking to Morgan Freeman's company about 
you know, creating an avatar of Morgan and how we could we could then he could then use monetize his likeness as a digital avatar. We were, I was trying to put this all together back in 2018 with like Zoe Saldana and Arnold Schwarzenegger and stuff. So, so all these so you've been around. Yeah. you've been one of the guys that has been on sort of the long tail journey of reduce the um, the eerie effect, the uh, uncanny, on an uncanny valley, right? So you would yeah. you would be an expert at working to remove the uncanny valley. Where would you say we sit now at the very end of 2023, moving into 2024, the mid-2020s, in terms of the digital creation, the use case of AI and all the different pieces and parts? Do you think we're actually at a point where, I mean, certainly we've all seen deepfakes where we're like, okay, I, I wouldn't, if you didn't tell me, I wouldn't know that this was not the actual human. Are we at that stage yet, in your opinion? I certainly think we are. I think it's, it's, it's um, content specific. Um, you know, when, when you've actually spent years building these things, you can literally make one move and then suddenly it doesn't work. And then one move this way and it looks amazing. Um, so it's not like a one size fits all again. It's not like, oh, we have a digital human. Um, it can just exist anywhere. It's all about how you experience that digital human, and how that, that is right, articulated yeah. to. You. And that's always the case. Um, and I think so there's there's a sort of fallacy about you know, building digital humans and what's involved in that. It's not just like, here's the digital human. What are you going to do? You know, it, it's it's very, very specific as to what you do. And so all the projects that we were involved in, we were making the most cutting edge digital human, you know, characters out there. But I was always like, well, let's put it in VR because you can, you can, there's so much that's being tricked in the mind in VR to make that. It's, you know, as a screenwriter, it's all a trick. It's all smoke and mirrors, right? It's all like, how do we fool people into believing that this is the thing? It's the su suspension of disbelief. It's just, the, but when you're dealing with technology people, there's a sort of emphasis like, how do we get this right and correct? And this is this is now we've now we solved the uncanny valley. Well, you'll you'll never solve it because it's not really a problem. It's not a technical problem. It's actually a problem with perception and our audience. And our, I think our it's audience, un uncanny valley is just an aside, highly subjective. Right. I have yeah, never, it, never experienced Uncanny Valley in 40 years of doing this. And, and of course, the technology is so much dramatically better now. Still haven't experienced it. Haven't talked to anybody who's had an experience where their skin has crawled dealing with some kind of a simulation. So I, I, I don't doubt that some people feel that way, but I'm not sure it's as big a thing as we've I, made I, it out to be. I, I think it's, you know, like like with most things in life. It's a very nuanced conversation and a very specific conversation around certain forms of creativity and audience perception, and that's a long conversation. But honestly, I mean, if you, you know, my my son is my my litmus test for everything. He's eleven, <laughs> turning twelve, and Perfect. he's just grown up with digital avatars, gaming, the whole bit. It's like this is just this is just his world, and it's like we're a sort of generation of you know men in our fifties who who. Um, don't come from that and all this stuff isn't native to us so we, we, it's a different conversation and i just yes. i kind of think yes. it's the conversation that conversation will be and kind of is kind of irrelevant um yeah. so you know it's a different kind of thing i think there's a more interesting conversation to be had around identity and digital mm -hmm. avatars um there's a there just last night at the LA games award you know kojima has, has launched a, a announced a, his a collaboration with jordan peele as a sort of movie film and they had, uh, you know, works by Three Lateral up there with with uh, Udo Kerr, the German actor. And, they, and they, I can say, okay, I can see what they're doing there. And there's a sort of thorny bush to navigate around identity because if, you know, if you're creating a character, so let's say Superman, you create Superman. Now, do you want Superman to be a digital scan of Christopher Reeve or whoever's playing Superman now? Or do you want Superman to be Superman? You know, if you if you if you marry that identity to a specific actor, then you're going to get into all these like thorny, thorny issues, which, you know, re the recent SAG negotiations have obviously thrown up for good reason. Um, so with my current movie that we're making, we're not using the likeness of the actors. We're just creating, getting great performances from actors, but the likeness themselves is the character in the movie. It's not from, from the actor's identity, you know? Well, let's, let's yeah, yeah. just reel back a little bit because <clears throat> that's the part that I'm so excited uh, to hear about how do you, what does it mean to make an Unreal Engine movie? Because I understand you can make a movie using virtual production techniques. I understand yeah. you could make a movie 
using cutscenes, but you're not talking about either of those things. You're talking about something new. Um, it's it's an evolution of all of those things. Uh, I mean, it, it's it is essentially you could say this is a cutscene from a video game. Um, you know, but we're using film techniques um, in terms of you know how we do approach actors, how we approach making shots. Um, it's basically using a game engine in how you make a game, but because now we have very readily available technologies to uh, you know put really cool you know good camera work in there and create cutscenes in sequencer, you are essentially creating a movie like a cutscene, but that's available to a whole group of creators that it wasn't before. So there's that democratization of the technology. Um, but I think what we're doing is really bringing a lot of cinematic storytelling to these technologies. You know, it's interesting that a lot of, a lot of gamers don't really understand necessarily cinematic performance and storytelling. And a lot of traditional filmmakers have no idea about game engines and all the rest of it. And so there's this real um, um, chasm that I'm hoping to bridge with this production to bring really a high level understanding of performance, of story, uh, but also really, you know, I've been producing in Unreal since, you know, 2015, does, 2016. Does, does the production have a story and when is yeah. it going to be finished? So so it's... it's I mean, the production of a story doesn't have a title? Yeah, it's called Bad Vibes. So I just announced that at uh, Unreal Fest. I did a talk at Unreal Fest uh, last month. I just did a talk this week on the uh, real-time conference. Um, uh, that's an that's, uh, evolution, uh, the next follow-up talk of, of what I talked about at Unreal Fest. So yeah, it's it's a uh, you know I wrote it as a script. I basically two years ago I thought what we need to do is I you know my core skill is as a screenwriter. So let's employ that and my experience of all of these realms in VR, AR, gaming, understanding the technologies, understanding digital human performance with avatars, and I need to put all that into something that we uh, can make. So it needs to be as a low budget. Um, it needs to use a lot of off-the-shelf um, components. So using what is basically proving what is out there for anyone can use. So Unreal Marketplace assets. I, I reinvented how we make a movie. So I used a lot of crowdsourcing for the production. So I've got a, a community, you know, the uh, um, the Unreal community. Um, you know, I've, I've got a Facebook group called the Real Time Filmmakers that's got, you know, thousands and thousands of, of, of members. And so I've created a lot of uh, public challenges, uh, competitions uh, using Unreal to crowdsource aspects of my production. So we can sort of you know, bring the community in to make it and it also lowers our costs, but also we're using Unreal Marketplace assets that, you know, the assets of my movie, for the environments at least, uh, is costing like 1200 bucks. So when you think you're creating all these environments for really not very much money, so that's part of the goal is to prove as to creators, like we can bring the cost down of making this, we can control, we can own it, we can create stuff that we want to create, but not only bring the cost down, but create all sorts of paths to new revenue that were, were not available to, to traditional filmmakers. You know, if you make a 2D linear rendered movie, that's it. That's, that's the end point. Whereas if we've made our movie in a 3D interactive and potentially immersive game engine, well, then think of all the outlets of how we can then use what we've made to be monetized. So, yeah. you know, UEFN, Unreal Editor and Fortnite is one of them. Like we can, so we create a 2D linear rendered movie, but we can also put all of our movie environments into UEFN so that people can literally, you know, right. live inside of around your movie. Or be inside of your movie, um, you know, because it's already native in, in Unreal. You know, if we wanted to, we could put that into VR. Um, but, you know, something like UEFN and a movie, these are two massively monetizable environments. So if we have a product that we can, you know, sell to a streamer, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, whoever, and we have a monetization strategy on UEFN where Epic Games is pay, pay, paying us for our audience participation, and then that's like a cross-sell for our audiences. So anybody who's experiencing the UEFN game can then go and watch the movie or people who watch the movie and say, hey, why don't you explore that scene or world in UEFN? So it's a, it's a, it's a, Unprecedented. UEFN, just for our listeners, is Unreal Engine. Unreal, Unreal Engine for Fortnite. Fortnite. So, so basically, uh, Epic Games. Um, obviously, you know they make Fortnite, probably the biggest game on the planet. Um, they're, they're shifting more into sort of platform play, similar to Roblox, but different. In that, you know, Roblox is a. Is, they don't make a game. They they basically have a platform where users can make the games and then those games are monetized and those 
game creators on that platform are rewarded for you know player usage within that. So Epic Games on the architecture of Fortnite have created UEFN, which is the Unreal Editor in Fortnite, which is like the, Un the Unreal Game Engine Lite um, in Fortnite. So you're basically able to publish a game uh, for free. So I can, all of my Unreal environments for my movie, I can then publish. Doesn't cost me anything other than optimizing those environments for UEFN. And not only that, you now have access to the 100, 200 million monthly active users on Fortnite who can discover your movie world and go and play around in it. And Epic Games will then pay you for <laughs> players that go into that world. So once you have a monetization strategy that is totally changes the, the economics of what a movie is, then you can be a creator. You've lowered the cost of your production. Of how much have you lowered it? And, how much, I mean, how much is the budget? So we're making this movie for less than half a million dollars. What? And this is a <laughs> and this is a full two so, hour, so two hour plus cinematic <laughs> passive entertainment piece of content, correct? This will be an hour and a half. It's a mm -hmm. horror movie. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 um as I said, we've crowdsourced it. We've we've um you know Epic Games put money in. We've got a mega grant for it. Uh, we I mean so what I do is leverage um the community. And I leverage brands who are interested in this space. And, you know, I basically made the production a conduit for innovation and experimentation. And so, stylistically, stylistically, is it is it photorealistic in style? Is it highly stylized? Like, what's the what's the expectation? Will it look like animation? Will it look like live action? What is the, the goal set? It, it's a very interesting question because everybody's, you know, like, the way uh, people, the industry comes to, is it, is it live action, is it animation? And I had this big debate. I had to I spent four months convincing SAG that this was not animation. Ah. That it falls into their live action category. I said, well, what's Avatar? And they said, well, that's live action. I said, oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, well, uh, then this is live action. <laughs> if Avatar's live action, <laughs> this is live action. Um, so, yeah, what is it? It's, it's um, highly photorealistic, but the, the story... Um, as much as I'm going to reveal is that it's a it's a horror movie about a bunch of gamers who find themselves as avatars inside a virtual simulation. So inside a game. So story wise, I've basically um, um, undercut any notion of Uncanny Valley or whether this is real, because that's I've incorporated that as part of my story. And I think any successful I mean, horror is actually a very interesting. Zora. In my talk, I talked about um you know, Blair Witch or Paranormal Activity or VHS, they basically, as filmmakers that don't have a lot of money, that then use the technologies like mini DV to go and make a movie. But in order to, they make that a a, 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 a feature, not a bug, you know. So it's made on, you know, Paranormal Activity. Of course, it's made on mini DV because it, it can only be made on mini DV. Um, and yet it's the most high, Paramount. It's the Paramount's most successful, most profitable movie is, is, right. is Paranormal Activity. So um, so in the same way, you know, we have to be smart as creators to, well, this is a whole new palette, a whole new way of creating a movie. So it should look different from a movie. It should look and feel like something new and different, but we've turned that into a feature rather than a bug, you know, because there's a lot of like, at the moment, looking in the rear view mirror, oh, it has to look like a movie. Well, it has to look like Star Wars looks, or it has to look like a Marvel, whatever, whatever metric we use to measure what a movie should be. And I think what any technology that, that is brought into the realm of filmmaking, and this has happened throughout the history of filmmaking, you know, when Jean-Luc Goddard stepped out into the streets of Paris with handheld cameras, that was a revolution. You know, when Dennis Hopper took cameras on the road and, you know, like that was a revolution. Um, and I yeah. think, you know, movie history is full of all of these examples where technology has come in and it's generally been a group of younger filmmakers like like the 70s, 60s, 70s, you know, this, the, the ushered in this new realm of filmmaking and that just became the norm so um you know i think what we need to there's a lot of backwards looking at the moment and i kind of think like hey let's just actually be looking forwards and really leaning into the technologies rather than trying to use these technologies to sort of mimic something that worked in the past you know well john i think it's really interesting that you touch on that because a lot of the stuff that i think about and talk about somewhat publicly and i imagine there is a struggle that you will be going through you can be as transparent as you want mm -hmm. in terms of 
when technology starts to overtake the art, the cinematic art, it tends to get antiseptic and it tends to get too technical. Yeah. And, you know, you made the reference of Paranormal Activity and Blair Witch. And when filmmakers or creators find a way to actually make things messier and more organic yeah. and less technically perfect yeah. is when the magic actually starts to happen, when the human conditioning starts to accept the reality because yeah. it's not perfect. And even if you look at a, a, it, a, it feels a real, like it feels Avatar, authentic. Which, correct. It feels authentic. And even well, when you look at a world like Avatar, which is highly photorealistic, highly like massive budget, the dynamic camera moving that Cameron is doing is all about creating that illusion that it's really happening, that it's not yeah. antiseptic. Yeah. Um, so I think well, it'll be interesting to see your end product and how you're fighting against that, especially when you're crowdsourcing something where people have a lot of technical skill, but maybe artistically don't understand the vision of how to make it feel real and connected. Well, well, that, well that's, the, that's the interesting thing is, is that actually as a writer, producer, director, you know, I've got a very small core team. And I can actually, I know exactly what I need from over there. So you can, you can crowd, that's the amazing thing. You can crowdsource these aspects. It's like, okay, I need this environment built. It needs to look this certain way. I can, I can build all of my environments in SketchUp and then send my developers an FBX of that, of that environment. And I can then give them all the assets that I've bought from the Unreal Marketplace to like, this is what it is. This is this Victorian parlor. And it's like, oh, this amazing, amazing world. And it's actually pretty straightforward and simple. Um, you know, and then I can get to art direct that myself, you know, I've already curated all of the assets. So, you know, and then I go in there and like, you know, the next stage is uh, mocapping the movie. We've cast all the actors, um, you know, working out what my mocap strategy is, is, is like, because again, like I said, this is a whole, this is a conduit for innovation and experimentation. So things like mocap is undergoing a current revolution in what that is, you know, with technologies, with AI that suddenly become a lot more usable. You know, we've, uh, you know, we've had an amazing mocap for the last 20, 30 years, but now suddenly, you know, it's like, well, you put an XN suit on or you use Move AI. There are so many new different options for capture um, that are just... Yeah, with what, with what you're doing, it is very possible, technically possible, that you could do your mocap recordings in the living room of your house. You don't yeah, necessarily yeah. have to go to a mocap stage and spend the dollars and the, and, and the to technology. No, no, the technology has really come to smartphones. It's come to smartphones. Well, yeah. it, we're, yeah. I mean, we're actually going to... So we, we, aim, we aim to mocap our whole movie in, um, in a week. So, you know, a whole feature film. So we can get 20, 20 minutes of screen time out a day because we're basically rehearsing the whole movie. Um, as I say, it's, it's six gamers trapped inside a simulation. So it's a horror movie. So they get whittled down one by one. So you, they start with six and they get whittled down. So, so you can imagine it actually helps having all of the actors in the volume together. But that's where we get the advantage of. So a lot of, you know, Again, I'm, I'm, I'm taking what's good about acting and performance. Like actors love theater pieces. Actors love working off other actors. So I'm basically getting the best out of our actors, which movies don't necessarily, you think about making a movie, it's the most artificial process in the world. You know, you've got to, you know, you're only going to say this line to this line. You've got to step on this mark. You're only going to do this shot. And then you've got to do the reverse shot. You've got to match that with the wide shot, with the close up. It's the most artificial, you know, environment for actors to be performing in. But theatre is this lot more organic environment. And we're actually able to capture, you know, acting up. When I, was work, when I was working with Kevin Spacey on Call of Duty, Kevin was obviously a big theatre guy. He just loved it because we would capture all of the actors acting every single role all at once. And then you're putting the virtual cameras in and seeing what, how to cut it, seeing, seeing how to put it together. And actors love that because they're literally in this organic space working together. So, well, again, all of these myths about, you know, this is taking away from actors or synthesizing actors. I'm a huge, huge fan of actors and belief in, in, the, in, in what human beings bring to this process. And I think the fallacy is that, you know, we as creators have to take these tools as writers, directors, as producers, as actors, AI. This is a, this should be a tool in our toolbox. You know, it's not just the tool for the studios. It's like that's why right. I'm all about, uh, you know, creating an economy around creator, you know, creator content. You know, utilizing all of these technologies for us. You know, <laughs> so yeah, that's we can funny. I just I just said to Ted, now that the strike is over, I think the creative people are starting to realize uh, the power of the tools rather than the threat. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I think there's obviously a lot of fear in that. I mean, that's what I've been evangelizing about this for, for years. And obviously, I've got a really uh, uh, in-depth understanding, you know, working knowledge of all these technologies. And that's part of what I want to do is like, you know, I'm, I'm making my movie, but my movie is should be a spearhead, you know, to prove what we can do and to show how we can do it. This should be like the boilerplate of like, OK, let's all crowdsource this. Let's get, get these creative community to this. Let's let's make all this really cool stuff that can be super interesting and fresh and new because it doesn't have to follow a formula anymore because we can keep the cost down um, and we can monetize it in a way that we can make it, you know, so the cost of failure, that's, I mean, that's a, a lot of the, the problems with the current industry is like, well, the cost of failure is huge because it's like $30 million, $100 million, $200 million for a production. So it can't fail, you know? And so everything's put in, it becomes a very vanilla at that point, you know, it's like, I mean, I kind of saw that on Call of Duty. So, you know, it's a three year cycle. I was on it for two years. And at the beginning, everybody's full of really cool ideas as to how we can change gaming, how we can do it. Yeah. And then in the last year, it comes down to crunch time and then everybody gets super scared and like, oh, let's just, and so it becomes like, what's the, what's the idea that's the, 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 gets the most agreement, the lowest common denominator. And there are a lot, a lot of voices that have to have agreement. So then everybody agrees on the most mediocre, you know, vanilla kind of solution. And suddenly it's not so interesting anymore. You know what I mean? You haven't, you know, killed the goose that lays the golden egg. You've successfully made another call of duty thing, but you haven't really done what we know we could do, you know? That's why Riot Games is such an interesting success yeah. story, you know, when they were with League of Legends and they had this very unique vision of a, a yeah. five on five sort of player versus player universe, but they didn't want to build a video game like a Call of Duty or a Battlefield yeah. or, a, you know, any, any of the big sort of AAA titles. They wanted to take their own path and drive organically to a new form of interactive play. And it's massively successful. And what's incredible is they've stuck to their knitting for so long, for so many cycles, with so much influence of, you should go here, you should do this, you should do this. And they're like, no, we're actually just going to keep doing this. Yeah. Uh, and I, then, I, you know, when they eventually, to your point, of start to migrate that into media, they take a hyper-artistic, very slow boat approach when they did Arcane. And yeah. it became a huge hit in and of itself because they didn't do shortcuts. They just took the story elements and built something, you know, animated, obviously, sty- very yeah. highly stylized, but it was their unique vision of how important those characters were to people, as opposed to taking the easy path out. And I think that was really interesting. Well, and that's the thing. It's like they stuck to their original vision of what they knew was going to work. It's fresh. It's new. It's groundbreaking. Um, you know, I have nothing but admiration for those guys and, and what they're doing in, in gaming. And I think that's, you know, everybody who's... It, you know, the people who take the so-called risk, <laughs> you know, it's not really a risk. It's actually, you're going to create something new and interesting that's going to last for a long time that everybody wants to do. So, um, you know, it's not really a risk. Uh, the risk is actually, the, the fatal thing is just doing the same thing you've already done. And right, we've got all of these thing, technologies yeah. available to us for creators, for monetization, for so many things. And I say, I'm kind of getting a lot of interest now from from tr- more traditional Hollywood folks uh, who are very interested in, in what we're doing. So, um so it's going to be the next few years, I think, could be really, really interesting for creators um, and actually putting the great technologies that are out there to use. That's you know, that's another stumbling block with the technology is like we need what's the killer app? You know, what's the great piece of content that's that's going to show what we can do here? And I think we have that opportunity now. I think if somebody makes oh, Game of Thrones for interactive media, it's going to be you, John. <laughs> <laughs> That's all the time we have this week, everybody. John, it's been a pleasure. Uh, I have learned a lot. I can't wait to see your movie and hear more about how uh, video games and Hollywood uh, are coming together. Uh, and I think that's, you know, obviously been a big theme for us for all 172 episodes. So thank you for being our guest yeah. on episode 172. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you back here next week. And uh, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you, guys. Thank you.